The idea is that we think of ourselves as like a little dandelion plant and all the seeds come here and they we teach and we do our thing and then the seeds spread. That was Maggie Marks, Director of Garden for the Environment. I'm Jeff, and this is Storied San Francisco. In this podcast, we continue our City Gardens series. Maggie picks up where she left off in part one, going into a little more depth about coming on board at GFE roughly a decade ago. Then she shares the history of the Inner Sunset Teaching Garden. Maggie talks about some of the ways they pivoted with the pandemic. And we end this episode with Maggie's thoughts on what it means for herself and the garden to still be here in San Francisco. Here's Maggie. So much of having an urban garden is having access to land. I mean, land access is obviously an issue that transcends time. And it's been, it's, it's, it's an issue that has been relevant for as long as people have been occupying land. Right. Occup- taking land away from other people, I guess. Right. But um, so much about gardening, particularly urban gardens, is who's your landowner, and so therefore, like, how long do you have it? Right. Um, Which determines what you can do with it. What you can with do it with it, and, it right. and what you can build on it. And so um, it was an open plot. I wish I knew a little bit more about the about exactly how it was formed. 2020 was our 30th anniversary. And one of the big projects I had in mind, I think I mentioned this to you when I met you last time, was I wanted to do a storytelling night to get a lot of this history recorded. And we had to cancel it because of the pandemic. And I really am hoping to do that, to bring a lot of the voices of people that were here to try and get it really recorded. And you'll, um, ha- and you'll have to let me know so I yeah, can come and just I would love everything. That. Yeah. So it was 1990 um, and there was a huge drought in California mm-hmm. and there was an organization called the San Francisco League of Urban Gardeners, SLUG, mm-hmm. and they managed sort of all of the community gardens and public gardens in San Francisco, including Alamany and places like that. And so um, they saw this plot of land and reached out to the PUC to get special permission to like a license to op- to create a demonstration garden here. And the whole mm-hmm. idea was, you know, the PUC's principles of keeping clean water for our, you know, our beautiful watershed mm-hmm. is such a key component of organic and regenerative gardening. Too. Right. Um, and so we started, we broke ground in July of 1990 and the idea was to create like a demonstration and teaching space, which makes us really different than a lot of other gardens yes. in the sense that there are some other gardens that teach classes, but it's not necessarily the core part of what they do. Right. Um, and so the idea is really just to be a space where people can come and practice and learn and be hands on. And also as a demonstration space, sort of be inspired. So like come through and think, Oh, I could do that. Or I like that plant or, you know, this is a, this is an idea of how to build a garden that works with nature. So Mm -hmm. our whole garden is with this idea of more biodiversity. Like we more is more, you know, like create, we create layers with plants so that we can create habitat for creatures tiny and up to, you know, we see hawks in this neighborhood. Oh, wow. I'm sure there are raccoons that party here at night when I'm not here as well. (laughs) That's (laughs) That's San Francisco. They're everywhere. Yeah, mm-hmm. especially in this neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so the garden was sort of developed from the south side. So if you come if you come by on Warren Drive, which is sort of our south entrance, that was the beginning. Okay. And over time, we have sort of, you know, added to and developed the whole plot. Um, but it is wild seeing pictures from 15 or 20 years ago, and some of the hillside is just sort of like a meadow feeling or lots of weeds and it hadn't barren yeah i wouldn't say barren but like yeah definitely not weedy. developed you know yeah yeah and we have orchards up there now mm-hmm. and the native plant area um was it always the same um acreage like the same mm-hmm. yeah, ba- it's ba- been boundaries, the same boundaries just developed by jeffy over yeah, time yeah it's okay. just that for lots of parts of it you know you're you're deciding how you're going to use the space or I, want, I don't want to use the word taming the space because we're not really trying to tame it. It's just more like, how can we cultivate it so that it's 
either providing habitat or food or something. For, I'll say collaborate. Yeah, collaborate with the, with the land, land. And yeah. because some of it's sloped too. That's tricky, right? Yeah. So on the we're on the base of Twin Peaks, so a lot of it's at a steep angle, which is where we have a couple orchards. And then we have a big section that we called our wild native hillside. So we've planted shrubs there that would have been there on this land originally. Right. And the idea is that we're really not touching that space. And that way okay. creatures can build their habitats there and nests and things like that. Um, so we're kind of keeping the human element out of it, keeping a space that's just <laughs> for animals. Another step one. I know it's yeah. kind of what GFV does and it's what a lot of us do, but like step one should be mm, get the humans out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, I mean, gardens are very uh, often very cultivated. You yeah. know what I mean? They're not right. wild spaces. Right. We try and let the wild happen, but they're very intentional. And so right. we try and have a space that's like not intentional, you know, which means that like at there's times of year where it to the untrained eye might look less beautiful or less tended mm -hmm. to. And it's because it's doing exactly what it should be doing. Right. That, that whole idea of gardens being beautiful yeah. and that subjective notion of beauty, yeah. that's, I mean, Victor it goes back. Hmm. Yeah. And it's not maybe so, such a, such a wise way to do it. I said it earlier, but I'm like, if use of land or, or humans relationship to land can be collaborative, that's mm -hmm. kind of a good, way to go yeah right? I mean that's the way that we think about it is we're not trying to get rid of anything there are a few it. things that we're trying to like we'd rather if that raccoon didn't dig in our garden bed so we're going to put up a physical barrier to keep it out right but the idea is more that like yeah how can we be inviting more things in so that then the natural ecosystem can keep everything sort of in balance, balance. Um, a lot of our issues have been that the ecosystem has gotten out of balance because Correct. we've taken too heavy a hand in trying to change the ecosystem right um and i think in terms of what you mentioned about subjective beauty like there's a lot of idea of like what makes a garden beautiful and i think a lot of it is probably tied to i'm gonna say colonialism and just sort of like oh we you know we have these big lawns and then these very specific lush shrubs and that's beautiful and it's very tended to and manicured symmetry and all these yeah other and i think that and, that yeah. is something that i think that is a really wonderful shift that happens when people live in a beautiful place like san francisco is seeing the way that nature exists here and working with it and so you know just like really embracing some of the amazing plants that can thrive next to the the ocean and finding a lot of beauty in those mm -hmm. and like finding beauty in in what does well here and then also when things do well they're really beautiful right um whereas if you plant something that really does well on the east coast in may is pretty much never going to look good here right. and you're giving it a lot of water and a lot of fertilizer to try and get this idea of what you th of maybe it's even something you do love mm -hmm. you just don't necessarily live in the climate for where, it where it should and be and so the whole idea here is like can we embrace what does well we have this philosophy that we did not coin this term but it's right plant right place how can we find a plant that suits this particular location and i think it's and rather than finding like the way I was gardening in Bernal was I would go to the plant nursery and I'd see a plant I liked and then bring it home and put it wherever I wanted rather than saying, this is the space I have. What would work well here? Yep. Um, and I think that actually that like mental shift is like bigger than just the plants. Yeah. Um, I'm nodding because I was slash am the same way. Yeah, of I'm course. I'm trying to learn, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But rather like, okay, plants literally grow all over this planet mm -hmm. in very harsh conditions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you just think about like hiking up, you know, in Marin County and there's that little coyote bush clinging to the side of Mount Tan. <laughs> right. So something can grow everywhere and we just have to find what is that beautiful and unique plant that we want to be looking at every day, but that also suits the location. So right. that's a lot of what we're teaching people. Can we talk about, so... Um, I don't, I don't know offhand when, officially when this drought that we're still in started, but we're back in a drought. Yeah. Um, so how that sort of impacts the programming and, yeah. and the operations here. Um, yeah, let's yeah. Can we talk about that. I mean, I think to first off, like the drought is very scary and very devastating. And also, you know, there's a curiosity around like, is this just a trend towards a 
a climate that has less water. Right. Like this may just be the the way our climate is changing. Mm -hmm. I would also say that we were in a position where we were really, you know, I think our garden has struggled at times, but we were set up for this. Okay. We were already growing things that don't need a lot of water. Mm -hmm. um, everything is on drip irrigation, which only distributes water very specifically to plants. We actually only irrigate our plants during the dry season, which typically was May through October, although right. that's obviously changing. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of what we're growing are large shrubs with deep root systems. And this is helping to sequester carbon in the soil, which is crucial for climate change. Mm -hmm. Um, and also allowing plants to really access water deep in the soil. And so um, by growing those pr like larger shrub perennials, they were actually well set up to withstand dry seasons. Um, there are certainly like if we t if you were to talk to some folks here that are making plant selections, they would tell you there's certain things that we're probably choosing not to grow okay. anymore. Um, because of water issues. Because of water issues yeah. that like, you know, and then we have to be really careful about when we plant things. So um, the best time to plant in, in San Francisco is really end Halloween until February is ideal. Okay. The, you know, the crab closer season. you get. Yeah, crab season. Eat crab and plant. <laughs> Eat crab and plant. That works for me. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And so the closer you can get to Halloween, the better. And so, you know, really being thoughtful about if we plant anything later than that, just like being really conscious of how we're making sure that things get enough water when they're young. Um, so that then, you know, like our native plants have no irrigation, mm -hmm. but we do water them when they're young to get established right. so that they, you know, but then they're able to really, you know, they're creating really deep root systems. As I mentioned, that's sequestering carbon, that's holding organic material in the ground. We've taught composting since 1990. It's a really, oh, really awesome. core part of what we do. And to us, you know, compost is a huge part of the drought slash climate change. I don't know if I would say solution, but like part of the mitigation. Yeah. Part of what's going to, going to help us. So, right. um, you know, compost is really like holding onto moisture, adding those nutrients into the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about how GFE has, <laughs> weathered <laughs> the pandemic oh that's such a good question yeah so <laughs> i think it was march 7th we were doing this huge new this year oh sorry of 2020, 2020. Yeah. sorry no, okay. to me like march 7th is just always forever gonna be 2020 so <laughs> and it was just a couple week, weeks ago yeah be before it shut down we were doing yeah. this like huge new we were building a new wall um mariposa which is this amazing collective owned Landscaping company in East Bay was teaching us to do stacked stone wall garden designs. We were building this huge new bed. It was a big project and all this flagstone delivered. And then a week later, that flagstone sat there for eight months um, and we shut down and it was like one day we we're at the garden. And then by Friday, the 13th, I think it was, I said, I don't, we can't go into the office and we're going to be We'll be home for a week, maybe two. Oh, I remember, yeah, it's almost cute in hindsight. They were like, two weeks, maybe. I'm really glad I didn't know. Did anyone at all come out those first eight yeah, months? Yeah, so it was Someone really did. hard to navigate. And I have yeah. to say, like, no one, this was an unprecedented event, obviously. But for our situation, it was particularly hard because even once the, the city was like, okay, these are our public health policies, like, we didn't really know where we fell. Because, like, people aren't writing policies for public teaching demonstration gardens right. because we are really the only one. Right. So, um, I think around May of 2020, I started having um, our two program staff come out once a week. They would stay for an hour, maybe two, and they're they were allowed, according to the ordinance, to just basically, like, pick up trash and make sure that, like, nothing was dangerous. Okay. Um, and so as a staff, we got together and we were like, all right, what are we going to do? How are we going to zoom? Yeah. And or, also yeah. like, how are we just going to continue our work? So we started right. by creating a blog called Growing Gardeners. It's still on um, our website. And it was like every day of the week, we would post five days a week, I think, was a different topic. Awesome. So um, Trina, one of our staffers did an amazing, it was like Tuesdays and it was all about the GFE history. So she's, awesome. um, she's a film documentarian and she loves 
history and research. So she did a bunch of things about that. Jamie, awesome. who was working here at the time, did a kid post every week. So bring your kids to the garden and do garden bingo. Yes. Or this, you know, so we were doing things every, we were posting every day to try and, you know, connect with people and keep teaching. Mm -hmm. And we knew that public spaces were for a lot of urban folks, like what was saving them right. during that time. Right. Um, and I think that this space has always been very, very, very beloved by the community, but really became so important to, to neighbors, particularly during that time. And so, um, as I mentioned with our 30th anniversary, and so we were supposed to have this really big party, which we love to throw parties in the garden and invite people out and we couldn't do that. So, and you know, financially people were in a really tough place. Um, and so we just asked that if people could, they donate $30 in, in honor of 30 years. Mm. And the notes we got from people were just so amazing. People that we had never connected with that were like, one person told us their kid walked for the first time in the garden. Other people were like, this is saving my sanity. And I just think about that time in my life I had a little kid and like it was so crucial to be outside and be in spaces and it felt really safe here I think for a lot of people even when like everything felt so scary right and there was something I remember coming out at some point that summer of 2020 and I hadn't been to the garden in like four months and you know, there were weeds and to my eye, because I know this space like the back of my hand, there were a lot of things that needed to be tended to. And it also was totally fine. Right. <laughs> and it was this amazing resiliency. Like I was sort of like, oh, this is actually doing fine. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think the garden, she's like, oh, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> like, stop. Give messing us, with me give us a break. <laughs> like, give me a break. Like on rainy yeah. days, we're always just like, let's just leave her so she can like do her thing so I felt like it was a really coming here was actually really really reassuring for me because mm -hmm. I was like oh okay like so much is up in the air but this place is doing okay um and then we started doing zoom workshops which for us, an organization of three staff like we're yeah. less than three full-time staff in total right. is a huge undertaking for <laughs> us and even like getting a zoom account and like having to develop PowerPoint presentations because our teachings in person, like all of that was a huge um, time for us. And like, it cost us a lot to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but we were starting to reach so many people and it was actually really amazing. And then we run this three month training program called Get Up. We've run it since 1996 and it trains community advocates around gardening and regenerative gardening and the idea is that we think of ourselves as like a little dandelion plant and all the seeds come here and they we teach and we do our thing and then the seeds spread awesome. and we don't really know where they end up because a lot of times they create their own dandelion plants that keeps right seeding i love it but um get up is the dandelion of, okay. of our work um and so we've run this program since 96 and for the first time ever we canceled it in the fall of 2020, which mm -hmm. was really hard for us yeah. because we also felt like, you know, there was a pandemic raging, but like the climate was still warming. It's right. not like that stuff was stopping. Right. It's just that we couldn't co connect and people were so isolated. And so in spring of 2021, we decided to offer it online okay. and we were really anxious about it because so much of gardening is touching soil. Yeah. Like that's a using your senses, so much of this program is like, you know, um, we joke here that we grow gardeners. Like it's the people, you right, know, right, right. the plants are the medium. Mm -hmm. And so we were really worried about doing it online and it ended up being so amazing. Awesome. Um, and we had such an incredible class and people were really zoom fatigued. This was a year into the pandemic yeah. and people still came for eight weeks, mm. every weekend, many weeknights to do our program and to be able to build community and see that you could still build community online was so amazing to watch and participate in. And then we got to have their graduation in the garden. So yeah. When did y'all come back? We came, Toward the end of so 2020? So we were open for a while in the fall of 2020. Yes. 
and then think then then the ho- then, then everyone's mm-hmm. holiday plans got canceled right. and we closed again. Right. Um, we start, but staff was pretty much here consistently to maintain the space. And I was not one of the staff people. I was actually on maternity leave. And I just, you know, I think the staff was thrilled to me in the garden. And also, like, we like gardening with people. Right. So it was a little lonely. Yeah. Um, so we were we brought volunteers back in May of 2021. Okay. So it's been about almost a year that we've had, um, that we've had, yeah, I know. That was me knocking so, on wood. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that right now what we have learned is that like so many people like we've been able to adapt like we have all of these tools that we didn't have before i actually feel like it kind of like technologically progressed us like almost 10 years in like six months because we had to learn so much and made us a better organization because of it um so and so yeah they so the get up students they graduated in early may so they were like nice and they saw each other's faces for the first time in person. They had yeah. never met before. Yeah, a lot of Kleenex for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was it was really really yeah. neat. Yeah. Um, and so we offered Get Up twice last year because we did our regular fall program. Awesome. Yeah. Um, can you tell? I have one more kind of big thing that I'd, yeah. I'd like to end on before we do that. Can you tell folks how to get involved? Whether yeah. it's what you know, yeah. you name it. Yeah. Well, we are open to the public 365 days a year from dawn until dusk. We have no gates on this garden. It's very intentional. Um, so you can walk through any time. You can bring a picnic. One time I saw Oof. a group of women having tea here, and it just made me really happy. Yes. Um, and so you're always welcome to come through. We're on the corner of 7th and Lawton. Um, our website is a really good resource, gardenfortheenvironment.org. And we have our workshop calendar. We have a lot of great workshops coming up. Get Up, that program I mentioned, applications will be available at the end of May for a program that starts the second weekend of September. That's a really great thing to check out. Uh, We have a newsletter you can sign up for. We really email like once a month, so it's not Mm -hmm. a huge amount of inbox inundation, but Mm -hmm. um, we keep a lot of our events in there and then also really try and amplify the voices of other communities gardens that are doing amazing programs Mm -hmm. one of our program managers is out um with nature in the city and sutra stewards looking for green hair streak butterflies right now they're on a walk okay um as in right now right right now as we are recording looking for the green hair streak um butterfly and she saw one she's very excited and then we are also on social media our instagram we are relatively active garden for the environment is another good way to sort of like passively keep up with us but you'll Mm -hmm. see new workshops get posted there and sort of insights from the garden awesome um we have volunteer hours also on wednesdays and saturdays and it's a really great way to sort of like i think a lot of people are intimidated by gardening Hmm. A lot of people tell me, they're like, oh, I have a black thumb. The thumb thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's... And I'm like, yeah. well, you wouldn't expect to speak a foreign language without you, ever learning it. So or, the or, whole idea is to learn it. Yeah, any, yeah. any number of things. You can't play the guitar like, without actually picking one up. So, um, yeah, the you know, gar- volunteering is a really good way to practice with staff to support you. To green your thumb. To green your thumb. It's All thumbs perm- can be green. Not a permanent condition no, to not be green. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, well, thank you. I would like to end with our theme on the show, and we're actually wrapping up our fourth season, but our theme this season has been We're Still Here. Mm. Can you speak to that and what it means both to you and, and to Garden for the Environment to still be here? Yeah. I mean, to me, I guess it's that it's it still kind of surprises me that I work 12 blocks or wherever from where I grew up and being part of this neighborhood that I've lived, you know, on and off my whole life and seeing the way it's changed, but also the ways that it really hasn't. And I love, I really love that particularly about the inner sunset. I think this neighborhood is a really special place in that. Um, And I think for the garden, one of the things that there's been a lot of loss in the last few years um, on a macro and micro scale, there's been a lot of loss in the garden community just with people moving away or land being developed or whatever it is. And something I'm just really proud of about GFE is to be one small part of a 32 year project that has, that is still here and is not only still here, but like 
doing so well and seeing people continue to get involved and to to see people come here and think oh I found my spot or like this is what I have been looking for or that come because they're really in grief and anxiety around climate change and are happy to have a place to be in community with people that understand but are also trying to do something about it um and so you know for however much San Francisco maybe is changing, to be able to work with volunteers and get up students and workshop students year over year and just see the continued interest in building community, um, that part of San Francisco is not changing and it's pretty cool. That was Maggie Marks. On the next episode of Storied San Francisco, get to know Emmy Kaplan of Emmy Spaghetti Shack. Episode 46 drops next Tuesday wherever you listen to podcasts. Music for the podcast was produced, performed, and curated by Otis McDonald. Original photography is by Michelle Kilfeather. Aaron Lim of Bitch Talk Podcast is our contributing producer. And the show is produced and hosted by me, Jeff Hunt. Now in our fourth season, we have more than 190 episodes available on our website, storiedsf.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you can, please rate and review our show so we can reach even more folks. We love email. Drop us a line at storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Stay strong, stay healthy, and we'll see you next time on Storied San Francisco. podcast is a proud member of the bff.fm podcast network learn more at podcast.bff.fm bff.fm best frequencies forever